These slides are by Carter Demart uh, for the case from Mars. And I, I am plagiarizing them slightly. I will, I will give wrong captions to the slides, so we've, <laughs> my apologies to Carter. Uh, next slide. Uh, <coughs> if you're doing something like crude rotation on Mars base, because of the way the orbital um, transfer, the, 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 the optimum transfer orbits work in launch windows and things like that, you may have an incoming crew coming down to, with aero capture and these parachutes at about the same time that an outgoing crew desperately needs as much kinetic energy as they can get. So, yes. I, you know, I want to somehow tie a rope between the two of them and you know, sling them on. It's not that easy. Next slide. Um, there's been, okay, what is a tether? Um, a tether is a rope, a cable, um, some kind of webbing. Uh, here it's a ribbon. Um, there's not been a lot of work done with them. Uh, this is the Gemini and Agena uh, back in the, in the 60s. Um, they, they had this little ribbon and they tied them together and they spun around a little bit. Next slide. By the way, there will be a tether experiment launched this summer where they're sending a satellite, a, a tethered satellite, much higher than the shuttle to test the electrical properties um, of the tether, whether it can generate power, um, and sense the atmosphere, sense the environment away from the shuttle. There's another tether experiment which will be launched in after that on the Delta. Okay. And I even heard of a tether experiment going up in the gas can special. I got 30 kilometers of tether in this little gas can on board the shuttle. Um, it really can be efficient material. Anyway, um, if you have a long enough tether, hey, hey, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about stationary or, or vertical tethers or skyhooks just for a moment. A lot of the plans have involved tethers that point directly at the center of the Earth and, and just rotate like a little device that can go going around. Um, the, the upper and the lower spacecraft are kind of want to be in different orbits. They're at different altitudes. They want to be going different velocities. Um, thus, you get some tension on the tether. If you break or cut the tether, they will go sailing off into different orbits. Um, through some quirk of the mathematics, they separate by exactly seven times the length of the tether when they're halfway around in their orbit. Next slide. Um, and there are serious proposals to, say, launch the shuttle, extend the tether, which is <coughs> satellite zooms up to be, you know, approximately seven times higher than the length of the drops down into a lower orbit, which you can arrange to skim the atmosphere and thus re-enter without um, doing up and homes burn. Next slide. You don't have to do that satellite deployment and shuttle re-entry at the same time. You could have a fairly massive base that stores the momentum. So um, an aerospace plane or a shuttle can come up, grab hold of the lower shuttle, be wrenched up or whatever, and then at some other time drop off. And you can deploy a satellite up to a higher orbit. And the, this station acts as a momentum in between the two. Next slide. Um, this, uh, this seven times factor gets into trouble when you leave the Earth. Um, there are proposals to put tethers on the moons of Mars. Um, if they are several kilometers long, you can get <coughs> up and down the Mars gravity well. Um, the, the, the moons of Mars are, are, are quite nicely placed. So you can drop down into a suborbital flight or you know, climb a tether off of the inner moon and then jump off and but on this scale, this, this is many thousands of kilometers. I, I, I'm sorry, a few thousands of kilometers. If you go to um, a very high orbit or a solar orbit, it, it's just unfeasible. Um, the planets are um, you know, tens of millions of kilometers apart. The tether to, to, go that, to, to send to that distance would be millions of kilometers long. So you just cannot have it. The hanging tether for infinite solar orbit. Uh, next slide. Um, I've heard a lot of people who talk about tethers 
that are afraid to let them rotate. They don't want them rotating because it's harder to analyze or um, various other reasons, or maybe just because they're unproven and they want to prove them first. But we also need rotation for other reasons. Um, here's this is the, the Mars transfer craft, like the Mars um, craft going to Mars. Somebody wants to take a shower with all the water falling down. They want to be able to sit at the table and eat. They don't want their bones and muscles out of um, For any long duration craft, we're going to have to be rotating. Next slide. And a lot of the current plans call for, for these rotating crafts to travel between the planets, but then you de-spin them whenever you do anything critical. When you get, when you, you assemble them unspun, then you, and then you send them off, then you spin them up. Before you arrive at the other planet, you de-spin them and uh, <coughs> drop off your, your passengers for your cargo. And that spinning up and spinning down is a lot of waste of, of fuel. Um, what I want to do is just hang tethers off it. Uh, next slide. Um, oh, rendezvous with a, with a spinning thing. Imagine you're a NASA administrator and you have this how many millions, billions of dollars craft. You know, maybe you've lost one in another accident, so there's only three left. Would you come near a spinning station? <laughs> Probably not. It's, it's, it's too risky. How do you explain it to Congress? Um, you, you don't want to just take an expensive craft into an expensive station and do, you know, come in fast into a hard dock. Um, next slide. Okay, um, I learned a lesson in square dancing. <laughs> Believe it or not, it applies to space. Um, there's a thing called an alamand. You, two, two dancing partners walk up and grab hands and turn around each other. It's a momentum exchange maneuver in square dancing. Next slide. Um, and there are lessons to be learned here. You don't just go up and grab the other spacecraft. You extend some highly maneuverable catching unit, like your hand, and the other spacecraft may or may not extend it. Um, you don't have your center of masses coming at each other. You, you know, they're, they're offset, so if something goes wrong, you just pull in your arm and the person goes by, or, this, or you pull in the catch unit that the spacecraft goes by. Um, awful lot of analogies to, to catching a payload with a rotating tether, hanging on, going around half a second to go. Uh, is the next slide blank? Okay, would you turn that off? And that will be on the overheads for a while. And um, I'd like to show slides a little later, too. Oh, plenty of time. Go ahead. It's hard to use solar power because the sun is spinning around you. Um, 
some other things. There's extra structural mass just for the, whatever's holding the spinning thing together. Um, you may only get one easy chance to rendezvous. It's, it's not the end of the world if you don't make the rendezvous. And there's a chance of your tethers being hit by meteorites. It's not as bad as you, as, as you might think. Um, in the event that things break, you go off into separate orbits. And if, you, if, if parts of your craft are valuable, you need a few to have. Next over here. Um, I don't want to bore people with um, equations. Um, a lot of plans need like, many kilometers per second, but the the mass of the tether rises incredibly fast. Um, the ratio of the mass of the tether grows by a factor of e raised to the square of the velocity that you're throwing something at. This, this scales even worse than the rocket equations. You've got a safety factor of four and three. What is that, an area? Um, strength. Which is area, basically. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'm not taking into account the weight of any protective coating. Um, there are a number of other minor factors. That so I'm if I come up with a fail safe tether that all the <coughs> rates at 70% load and don't last, I mean, the gain factor is three or four in the X zone. Um, what I wanted to do was plan a scheme that is very conservative. Um, I limited myself to, to uh, one to one and a half kilometers per second just to see what I could do. It's sort of like, you know, I've got this, this early steam engine locomotive. What can I do with it? I don't yet have, a, have high speed rail, but, but let's prove its feasibility with, with a early cheap system. Um, anyway, um, notice this is a log scale. This is the ratio of the mass of the tether to the mass of the payload. I, mean, I don't want to be thousands of times more massive than my mass of the payload. I want to be down in this range. And I chose one kilometer per second, which would be one to two to three times the mass of the payload. Um, and for some of the it's nice to push it out a little further where you're maybe eight times the mass of the payload. Um, I, the, that higher curve is what I would expect lunar fiberglass to be. Lunar fiberglass, once you can, are able to make it, is much cheaper to deliver because it's, it's already up there. So I throw that up there just for reference. Uh, perhaps parts of the tether may be made out of lunar fiberglass, the central part, but aren't under the lot of cheap things. Next slide. Um, and next slide after that. Um, you can play games with equations to figure out what what radius and speeds you want. Um, this is revolutions per second of the space station. That's the radius of the tether. So uh, I heard it. Uh, revolutions per minute. Um, and um, I wanted, uh, I'm sorry, this is this label. Um, Basically, for maximum speed, you want either very high rotation rate to, toward this end, or you want very high tethers. Um, next slide. Um, this is radius of the tether as a, as a um, wait, this is G levels, uh, the, the, the force of gravity on, your, on the occupants of your space station or on you know, people being transferred into your craft. Um, for people, you want to stay in this shaded area. Um, the, the habitats you want down here. Um, I superimpose these two graphs on the slide. Um, I, I, I don't expect these graphs to be terribly understandable, but I want you to understand the, the process I went through to choose my sizes. Um, that little shaded triangle up in the corner, up in the far corner, is the area that is below 4G's acceleration for people and above one kilometer per second leaving the space station. And so I wanted to work in that area for, you know, for, for sending manned capsules around. So I chose uh, one quarter of an RPM and we just barely squeeze in there. Um, I have another version that is for cargo only up at just under two RPM. Um, there are terrible trade-offs here. 
and I list them down here. Uh, to avoid motion sickness, you want to save a low RPM. To limit the acceleration on the passenger, you want to stay down. For maximum time to rendezvous, you want to stay up, uh, etc. There, there are about eight conflicting criteria. And there's this little tiny window in the middle where you can just barely make it work. Next slide. So you put that together, and you get some kind of central thing. And some some weights out out around it that's all spinning. Uh, people can live here in, in, in those outer ones, um, and you extend the tether down and catch it with its payloads. Um, this thing is fairly massive. It's five kilometers in radius. The tethers go out um, 38 kilometers. It, 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 but but it's it's believable. We have electrical power transmission lines that are far longer than that. You look at the reinforcing bars in a concrete highway, they go through miles. I mean, you know, I mean there are miles of reinforcing bar. Um, and I chose um, Martian normal gravity for these habitat nodes so that you can have comparisons and scientific studies control for, for Martian. Um, next slide. If you're only interested in catching and releasing unmanned payloads, scientific instruments or you know, bags of lunar soil or whatever. You can shrink the thing down a lot, spin it up to almost 2 RPM. Uh, 100 meters radius, um, the habitat nodes don't have to be at the same length. Um, your tether um, goes out 8 to 11 kilometers. But you have a much um, faster rendezvous. The, the, the rendezvous you know, is, is more critical. Next slide. Um, one innovation that I've thrown in is in the center of this, I'm going to have a truss along the axis. Um, so, so there I show a truss with these three counterweights uh, spinning around. And that allows me to pull the tether out of the plane of rotation. Um, the truss I'm going to call a north-south. There's a stay coming down from the north pole of the truss. If I pull on that, on that wire, you know, once per revolution, this tether will swing out of the plane. Um, there's not a definite limit as to how far you can swing, but it depends on, on how soon the various wires start interfering with each other. Um, so this is my basic configuration. Next slide. Um, I made a little drawing of it. Um, these counterweights can either be um, a shuttle external tank filled with whatever <coughs> you can find. They could be habitats. They could be a big moon rock. Um, I made my central truss with a couple external tanks. It could be a deployable truss. Um, you could, um, I tried to have a rotating solar collector in there. You can have e-spun um, docking and antenna <coughs> at either end of the truss. Um, these stays carry, uh, these cables carry most of the weight of these habitat nodes. These are for stability, um, and then there, there's a there's a node out here, just a sort of a pulley, which I actually pull up and down to get the tether out of the plane. Um, is this understandable? I, um, this is kind of the only overview that, I, that I'm going to give. So let me hesitate here. You have two tethers on this Uh Yes, um, there are actually three of these pulley nodes there and there and over there. And there's a tether extended from here. It's catching a payload. And somewhere down there, it's, it's either releasing or getting rid of a payload. I forget what. Um, so, so I allow for up to three tethers. Um, you could have more. You could have four or five. Um, I don't see a need for two. And you don't have them exactly opposite each other? <coughs> um, Dynamically? OK. Um, I'll get to that later. But in order to in order to, as you extend this payload, as you pull it in, that has to be decelerated. It has to have angular acceleration and deceleration. And this, this equatorial cable will have to take that tension. Um, so so I need to be able to pull those back and forth to some extent. Coriolis. Um, yes. Next slide. Okay, question? Uh, you, you use the cables around the outside to move the weights in order to counteract the difference. 
Um, yeah, and for balance. You know, an astronaut moves from one habit, habitat to another, it's a little bit off balance. You, you, you let them adjust to something. And, and, and I believe it's self-balancing. Um, but that's, that's much further on the talk. Um, a possible habitat node, it, it, its primary function is a counterpoint. So you can just use a move rock. But you could also have a little truck depot there. You can bring your, your transfer craft in, unload them, furbish them. You can live there, you can have greenhouses. Um, I threw a nuclear reactor down on the bottom. Um, no, no, I, I, no, I'm serious about that. Would you raise it a little bit? Um, um, toward me. Yeah. Whoops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, here's my SP-100 with a shadow shield, so that everything above it is shielded from the radiation. There's really not no reason to be below that. Um, you don't want to jump off the edge of the loading dock. <laughs> um, in the event that there's some tremendous damage, a meteorite comes through and, and you know, hits things, that will go away. Your hazardous fuels will, will, will go away. Um, one thing that I had real trouble doing is suppose those, those main cables are severed or break or whatever. Um, I really want this thing to be its own spacecraft, and I'd like gravity to be in the same direction it used to be. And I can't quite get the center of mass higher than the greenhouse. <laughs> I don't want the plants going the other direction. Um, I, I, I mean, you, you could imagine the center of mass being up there, so the plants wouldn't. I have a tiny bit of, <coughs> of weight to this thing is off flying by itself. And you would have thrusters on it. You aren't going to worry about the greenhouse. <laughs> <laughs> maybe so. Depends on what orbit you're in. If you're out near the asteroids, uh, you may be a long time to get help. What is the in direction that up is from? Um, oh, yes. Um, this, this has artificial gravity. Um, up, as you see, it is up from their point of view. This is basically a truck depot. You bring your trucks in and you service them. It's a, it's a small capsule. Uh, think of a Gemini capsule or a, a car spacecraft, 5,000 kilograms. Um, yes? I just saw some kind of a person had a mushroom capsule rotation. Uh, is it a first time loss of this whole structure? It would have been earlier. Um, you, can, you can pull on that tail. I was only interested in what you do. Uh, same as any spacecraft, you have thrusters in your motion. Um, now, uh, 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 the gyroscopic system. First of all, things are pretty far, far apart up there. Um, if you actually look at the, at the you know, collisions per year, it, there, there aren't that many. Uh, now, my biggest thing is the tethers that I extend to catch and throw payloads, and I, and I will have them pulled in when they're not. So, so even though they extend out to five or fifty kilometers, most of the time they're pulled into um, what hundred meters or two kilometers. Or you know, and yeah, and you, you'd, you'd want thrusters there anyway to adjust your orbit. They can be used for uh, Next slide. Oh no, I'm sorry. Um, the uh, those slides. Um, we now have a solution. We, we, we have this, a solution to some problem. We have this rotating space station that can catch and throw craft. What do we do with it? And some of the potential uses of it are <coughs> slides. Um, one thing is to catch suborbital flights. Um, you have the station in a low orbit. You send up um, a suborbital flight um, one kilometer per second less than orbital velocity. And, and, and you catch it, and, and then it, it, you, you send it off from there. Um, the rocket in the foreground could launch a mercury capsule on the suborbital flight. It didn't have a lot of downrange velocity. But the rocket in the background went to the moon and back. There's a tremendous difference in fuel needed for suborbital flights compared to going to your final destination all in one hop. Uh, this isn't quite a fair comparison because it was one pan and three pan. But it just gives you some. You know, some general idea of, of the difference in fuel needed to get over this threshold to get down to the atmosphere. 
And um, imagine this, this rocket in the front filled with something that fueled the cost of the gasoline. If you wanted to take a trip once in your life or so, you might be able to afford that much gasoline. And it's, you know, it's a lot more than your car takes in time, but maybe comparable to what you take, your car takes over its life or your life. Uh, next slide. Um, you want to get rocks off the moon, bring them back. You know, think of the rocks on the moon as being your iron ore in Minnesota. You want to bring it back to Pennsylvania to smell it. Um, and the, re the main reason I threw this slide in is this is a sort of, totally unrelated, this is the sort of thing that an NSS chapter can get involved in. This happened to be a contest at the International Space University to design a, something to pick up lunar dirt. But several volunteers from the Boston area were involved in it. And we, we got some, some nice publicity and contacts with students from around the world. Um, next slide. Um, some of the plans for an Earth-Moon transportation system. Um, You need anywhere from two to about seven of these stations um, to, to duplicate this, but you wouldn't need a pallet to go back and forth except for, for just course corrections. Next slide. Um, here's a proposed lunar lander and an, um, a transfer vehicle that grabs it out of lunar orbit, takes it back to Earth orbit, um, and back again. Even using, utilizing aerobraking braking when they can, they, it needs a lot of fuel do this conventionally. Um, the gold foil covers the cryogenic fuel tank, so this gives you an idea of the ratio of fuel tank to payload for, for conventional rockets. Next slide. Um, and one of the things that Mary Lander was carrying was fuel to fill up a depot, a fuel depot down in lower orbit. I, I want to get rid of these fuel depots. Um, next slide. Um, just to admit that I'm not, you know, there are lots of other people who have worked on this. This is Brian Tutson's and I think Danny Tedder's proposal. There's another, a number of other proposals for rotating tethers. Um, there's a rotating tether in Earth orbit that throws a payload of the moon where another tether grabs it. Um, in this case, he needed, um, to, to do it all in one hop, the tethers had to be um, approximately 10 times larger than the payload, um, eight, and eight and a half times and 12 and a half times. And this was with advanced materials. Next slide. Um, these rotating tethers, you can, you can throw uh, exploratory crafts in the, throughout the inner solar system. Next slide. That's an asteroid comet. Um, next slide. And you can also throw things to Mars, or at least almost to Mars. I, I need a little extra chemical to there. Uh, next slide. Um, as far as send, sending people around, um, I, I assume that we'd want a two-man craft, a little heavier, say 50% heavier than the Gemini capsule, so we have some extra fuel and food and, and safety equipment. Uh, 5,000 kilograms. Next slide. Um, now, how do you get to Mars in a Gemini craft? <laughs> um, well, I came up with an idea. You throw all the pieces of your interplanetary craft one at a time with this tether, and then you assemble them in route. This is incredible uh, motivation for the astronauts. <laughs> <laughs> Carter thought this craft was falling apart. I'm trying to put it back together. <laughs> uh, I quickly rejected this idea. <laughs> Next slide. Um, you can have a cycling spacecraft. Are people familiar with cycling spacecraft? You just raise your hand. OK, good, wonderful. <laughs> um, it's on a permanent or orbit between the Earth and Mars, as it passes the planet, you drop off small crafts, sort of like a ocean like you're dropping off a little boat. Uh, next slide. And, and the slide after that. Um, so here's my cycling spacecraft dropping off its Gemini class capsule. Uh, the tethers aren't shown in this. Carter didn't know about them, but he painted them. <laughs> next slide. Um, there may be some other things you can do. You may be able to sit up at the L5 position and throw heavy objects down to other space stations to help them make up momentum. Since you're at, at the L5 position, you don't, that's inherently stable. You don't have a, a problem with minor changes of momentum. 
Uh, Carter painted this station at the L2 position, but think of it as at the L5 position. <laughs> Next slide. Um, and this is by no means the, means the limits. You could, you could have rotating space colonies and extend the tethers from the L. I stayed away from multiple rotations. I didn't want the station rotating one way and the tether rotating the other way. But if you went to really big structures, you could do things like that. But I, let's, let's get this, this simple design you know, out in the space community first <laughs> before we start having you know, like helicopters with blades and cross each other. Next slide. Why would okay. you want to do that? Uh, that's it for the slides. And, and back to the I, I won't use the slides again. Um, if everything's in the same orbital plane, you can rotate in that orbital plane and throw and throw things anywhere you want. Now I have a little bit of out plane capability, um, but there might be circumstances where you want the tether rotating a lot faster than the station, and I'm I'm not doing that. <coughs> now you also might want to throw something into a polar orbit, and I, I'm not even considering that. It's a different plane. Yeah, you can get a little bit of different. Um, so Bob, you saw this yesterday with, with Bob Zuber. Um, he and I have a slight disagreement. Um, his arrows go that way. I, I change his arrows. <laughs> but here, here's Zuber's hypersonic craft coming up to one kilometer per second, one and a half kilometers per second less, grabbing on, unloading his passengers. Uh, next is you. Excuse me. Yes. In yesterday's presentation, I understood that Zuber was talking about his, his a sky book. It does right. have a thing. It yes. rotates once more. Yes. Oh, and, okay. and, and, and I borrowed his view graph and I changed the rotation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but but, but all, many of the principles still apply. It's just there are slightly different terms in the equation. And there are advantages to being, to being vertical and there are advantages to rotating. And we definitely want to run the experiments vertically first. <laughs> um, I'll run it, but it was a lot easier for the stationary thing. Running be much faster for the rotating and you have timing as well as position. Um, okay, as far, I, I, I worked through some of the figures for um, throwing craft away from a planet um, using relatively um, weak tethers by about forward stick, for instance. Um, so, so here's a, a payload in a low Mars orbit I have my station in the elliptical orbit, I grab it, I can hang on to it a long time if I want, but minimum half a rotation, and then I let go. And because I've thrown it at perigee, or, or whatever the para thing is for Mars, at, at the closest point to Mars, um, I, it, it has a lot of extra energy, more, more energy than you'd expect from that one kilometer per second, and you end up with, um, that's K, yeah. Um, um, <coughs> 2.7 kilometers per second um, is state velocity, it, it, uh, excess velocity over Mars. <coughs> if you do a chemical burn after you throw it, you can get a lot more. Uh, you need 4.2 to get um, to rendezvous with the cyclone spacecraft. Um, but only an additional uh, one kilometer per second from the chemical burn will get you that extra two and a half kilometers per second of excess escape velocity. And because the tether's reusable, you're sort of replacing one of the stages of your chemical rocket. Next slide. Uh, the, the Mars gravity well is, not, is a lot shallower than the Earth. These things don't work quite as well as the Earth, but, but they're common. I mean, you, know, you can do the same sort of things. Um, you can get a little bit of extra help. If, if you see this dotted line, payload up into an elliptical orbit, and then the station is in an even higher elliptical orbit, and you can get some extra advantages that way. Because as the station comes down near the Earth, it's going much faster than had it been to the lower orbit of the Earth. By the way, that station should be unmanned, because it repeatedly goes through the manned elements. Um, any, any questions on these? Could you say, state again, by how much chemical you're using, about one kilometer per second? Um, Oh, let's see. In this case, um, if I throw it with one kilometer per second from my tether, 
I will have an excess velocity of two and a half kilometers per second. Excuse me, Green Bay. If I add um, just one third of a kilometer per second, I get an extra 0.8. So it's, it's like tripling the effectiveness of my chemical burn. Now, now this is mostly because the chemical burn is impurity. You, you, you get that advantage whether you use a tether or not. Um, and if I add if I add almost a kilometer per second, I can run into the Mars cycle craft, which is going four kilometers per second relative to the Earth. It, it, if you're taking notes, you can come up and copy them later. <laughs> so, uh, next over here. Um, it doesn't work very well with the cycling craft. They, that was my original reason that I got into this project, was I wanted to, to throw my little Gemini capsules and my recent flight modules from the Earth catch them with a cycling craft, which also had a tether, drop them off, catch them again. Um, the, the, the velocities I get weren't quite good enough, but they helped. Um, I think in hindsight it's not worthwhile having a tether on the cycling craft. In hindsight, I have to keep this on the The people that I talked to who did the orbital calculations said they ran the equation up for 20 years. And they, assumed, and they needed adjustments after that, but they assumed that the craft wouldn't last that long. <laughs> so they want to come back to be refurbished. Um, by the way, there are two classes of, of cycling orbits. Um, um, next slide. Um, should I spend time on cycling orbits? No. Okay. Um, there, 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 there are two classes. Some of them have more frequent visits and, and higher velocities. But they skip that and that's one. Talk to Buzz Aldrin if you get a chance. Okay, um, what can we do near the Earth with, with these stations? You know, we have this, we got this truck depot, where do we put it? Um, if you only have a, if you're up to one and a half or two or three kilometers per second, you can throw it straight to the I said, what can we do if we don't want to risk that um, that design effort and use the really high strength materials um, for the improvement? Um, so I I can get from Leo to um, to, to, to geostationary. Um, okay, Earth <coughs> geosynchronous, and you put three stations in between. You can capture several little things and get them to Leo. Basically, this 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 bucket. Next slide. Um, to go from geo up to the moon uh, is a lot easier. Uh, this circle right here is geosynchronous orbit. And you can actually throw from below geo up to an intermediate and then up to um, anywhere in the moon's orbit or to the moon. You can have one around the moon that catches your thing and drops it down at much less than the orbital speed. Um, questions on, on this? this Bucket Brigade, um, these truck depots or railroad stations that are sending the train along. Similar, mm -hmm. similar analysis was done by Joe Carroll and came up with the same results. Yeah. Uh, question. I, I didn't catch the, the numbers you used. Is this approximately Kevlar technology? Yes. Um, yes. Spectra. Um, if it's spectra graphite, the tether weighs less than twice the payload, assuming there's no protective coating on it. Um, in lunar fiberglass, um, it's eight times the bigger payload. So, if you take your Gemini craft at 5,000 kilograms multiplied by eight, that's how much lunar fiberglass you need for, for one of these tethers. Now, by the way, I need to be able to reel, reel these tethers in and out at least to some extent. It, 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 not on all these nodes, but for, for, for the terminal nodes where you actually use the payload, that would be important. And not all the tethers can be reeled in. Um, next slide. Did you consider a uh, um, um, I don't want to spend time on this slide. <laughs> okay, but but here's the altitudes of the stations. Here's the velocities that the payloads arrive and leave at. Um, geosynchronous is here. Lunar orbit is here. Once you get outside of geosynchronous, it it only takes like 300 or 700 meters per second, less than a kilometer per second, to throw almost anywhere. It, it's really sort of analogous to um, Leo is down in a deep valley, and there's a plateau on either side, and they're incredibly broad. And in a sense, they might even be 
fertile because you have three rows of sunlight. Unlike if you get over on the surface. Um, come see me afterwards if you want the figures. Next slide. Um, other people have proposed putting a, um, a tether rotating horizontally on the moon's surface to get payloads off. Um, is this Joe Carroll, I think? Yeah. Um, uh, Bob Zubrin has a much better diagram, but it's only available to be on my computer. It wouldn't show up on <laughs> so, Anyway, a, a, a small tether on the lunar surface together with a tether in lunar orbit may be able to get lunar soil on. Next slide. Uh, the reason you want lunar soil is as your raw material to run your, your society, your commerce, your industries. Uh, you use any form of, oh, oh, or, or asteroid material. I, I don't mean to leave asteroids out. They may be better than the moon. You can use any form of material for shielding, for radiation. Um, I need ballast. They, these things need, need, their, need their weights in order to store the momentum. Um, soil, oxygen. Um, fiberglass or steel um, as building materials and, and the tethers. <coughs> Next slide. Um, well, here's, here's my design for a tether. Um, you have multiple strands for redundancy in case of micro-meteorite that severs one of them. You have these little spreaders to hold them apart, sort of like the telephone poles have the spreaders. Um, you, it may be desirable to have them naturally curved so that no matter which direction a micrometeorite comes through, we would only wipe out one or two or three of the strands. Um, but there are other advantages to having them flat. And um, according to the figures I got, um, Amico T1000 graphite to hold the Gemini craft would be 8,000 kilograms of, um, of graphite. It works out to be exactly one and two thirds ratio. This is not, this is. I really did work the numbers accurately, and it came out to <laughs> some common fraction. Um, the, the last time I saw a graph that had graph, the word graphite on it, it also had Spectre 1000. But I, I, it, uh, uh, let me keep going. Um, um, I tried to call up Amico. I could not confirm this. I also don't know if this can be rolled around the wind. All I'm saying is, is from that pair of Spectre 1000, it was just yeah. Oh, the signal. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, in my uh, contract that I'm working on, my contract before I've looked at this, you know, I've got an analysis and I'm watching people. Okay. They look good. Um, shall we keep going? Next slide. Uh, there's been very little stuff that I can find about catching penguins quickly. You know, all of the current rendezvous plans are very slow and majestic. Um, this is the only diagram I was able to find of a catcher. And, and the author said that it was um, just, hey, I, I'm sorry, I, you're right, I found a few others. The, the author admitted that this was just a, a schematic. Um, uh, next slide. Joe Carroll has a section. And, and, Oh, and um, Brian Tiddleston has a net where you stick a hook into the net and catch anywhere on the net, um, which I, I forgot to put on. Um, my, would you raise that a tiny bit? Um, my proposed design has a very small um, maneuverable satellite at the end of the tether. I, I call it the catcher. It, it extends fiberglass fishing poles um, 10 or 20 meters, you know, like, like the length of this room a few times the length of this room, and has some kind of wire in the end sort of like the arresting cable on a aircraft carrier. Um, you come along with a hook, you grab the cable. Um, if you're worried about the cable bouncing out, you can have these fishing poles snap together. Um, I have no idea if this would work or not, um, but, but there, there needs to be thought done on this. And here's, here's what's that looks about. almost identical to what they used to capture the discovery of Yeah. Yeah. But both of those, you have a gravity field here. When you hit that, all of a sudden your CG, you're going to start to bring your capsule up. Um, okay, well, okay these control. two are traveling at about the same velocity. You, you want a tiny bit of difference of velocity yeah. so that you actually do stack the cable. Um, you, don't want the, what do you, you don't want the payload to rotate, but you 
Um, well, wait. Well, once it's caught, once it takes up some tension, then it'll be in an effective gravity field. So as long as it doesn't spin around 180 degrees, as long as it spins less than 180 degrees, you should be okay. Um, yeah. 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 I, I mean, here, here's an excellent SBIR program. It's to design it, it, it's to some aspect of the catcher. Um, by the way, if you're coming in slightly out of the plane of rotation, you just twist the catcher 90 degrees. So, um, uh, by the way, releasing the payload is very easy. I, I didn't bother making it too graphic. Lots of ways to release it. Um, these are some kind of tracking antenna, laser rangefinder, whatever. Um, either the catcher or the spacecraft are both in maneuver. This is one of the major problems. Any comments on it? Beach work. Beach work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next, Charles. Um, rendezvous. Um, you maneuver the incoming payload so that it ends up approximately tangent to its catcher. And then I have a little real mechanism of the catcher. So at, at this point, oh, oh, by the way, you have um, tracking devices on the, on the central station and out here and there that are all you know, communicating through whatever the, the tracking people say is the best um, radar or whatever. Um, when you get close, you, the reel on the catcher pulls it in and you, and you try to follow these parallel paths until you're caught. Um, after you're caught, you can swing around 180 degrees and release again, or you can reel there. Next slide. <coughs> um, <laughs> okay, there was a comment earlier about these things being off-center. Yes, they are very off-center. <laughs> um, okay, I have just caught this payload, I'm reeling it in. It's going to want to swing faster than my station, so it's going to swing ahead of my station. I need, to trans I, I need to slow it down so there's extra tension on this tether. I pull this little pulley node in close to my habitat, and this habitat basically slows it down. Um, does that make sense? Do you understand how it's, it, 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 it's under this deceleration field trying to swing forward? Uh, so, oh, so yes. And, and, and I, I do software for a living, and I be, feel that I may have a lot of job security. <laughs> you know, and um, I, I haven't mentioned vibration. Um, you're going to have to be monitoring the vibration of this whole thing. You know, have, have your little corner reflectors a couple places down the tethers, so you can see the waves traveling up and down the tethers, and dampen them out, either passively or actively. By the way, they, Passive damper is little hydraulic cylinders on your screen door. Um, they, they are very simple. And they are relatively fail safe. Um, as you're as you're paying out a catcher or a payload, it would have the opposite thing. Um, it it's actually going faster, but it has the effect of slowing down the station. Um, it, it's speeding up even though it's lagging behind the rotation because as it goes out further. It has to travel a longer distance to get around the location. Um, the other thing on this view graph is, suppose I have a valuable payload that's coming in, like me. <laughs> I want an orbital transfer craft partly deployed on another tether so that if I don't catch it, or if I'm running low on fuel and I don't have enough fuel to get back to the station, uh, they can send an orbital transfer craft out after me to catch me and bring me home, bring me back to the station. And that's a major advantage of having more than one tether. Sure, Bruce returned. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, yes. I, I like the phrase. Uh, next, next one. Um, uh, it didn't make it on the view graph, but I think it takes about five minutes to reel in the tether. And you have decreasing acceleration as you're being, being reeled in from three to four G's on down to one. Luckily, this is one thing that did work out relatively well, is I didn't have to leave the guys out there for hours at G, or three Gs. Next week. Um, 
I believe this thing is self-balancing. This whole structure appears to be self-balancing. There's a central truss, and things can swing forward and back <coughs> slightly around the central truss. Um, so that uh, you reel something out, you change the center of mass, but if the center of mass is here, then this habitat wants to swing that way. All you have to do is allow it to swing, and, you know, to make sure it doesn't oscillate. But, but, but just reel this out and allow the habitat to swing away from it, and the center of the mass stays with, at, the, at the central axial truss. Uh, when you release the payload, you get a sudden jerk, and these habitats will want to swing back slightly, very suddenly. Um, but as soon as they swing back, as soon as you dampen any oscillation, then you're balanced again. So you don't have this terrible wobble that is not for very long on the central truss. Yes. What kind of uh, frequency are we talking about on any oscillator? Uh, incredibly low. Yeah. Um, so you would have trouble detecting Well, well you, could have, you could have a surveyor's instrument on the several places looking at corner reflectors everywhere else. Um, or, well, or, or you can measure them with accelerometers if they're, if they're that good enough. Um, I, 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 as far as frequencies, um, if you've been on a suspension bridge, you have some view of how, yeah. you know, it's, it's several seconds of oscillation. And that's, what, a half a kilometer, a quarter kilometer long. You know, some of these are bigger than that. So there's plenty of time to have the computer turn through its calculations to help examine this thing. Yes? I don't understand. Circle. Um, uh, why, why, why do you have a, um, a, so a circular Okay. Cable rather than right. direct cables. Um, the um, this is a bad view graph. The reason I have it is because my drawing package wasn't very good. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I made another view graph, but when I took it to the copy shop, they missed it and they didn't duplicate it. So, um, the, the, these cables would be straight when they're under tension. When they're not under tension, they would have some curve to them. But, but those circles are just cables. Down there's some typical force, right? So that yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, they would bend down somewhere. They could be allowed to be circular, but why yeah. would you want to bother? No. Why would you keep them no. under they would, some they would they would um, uh, They wouldn't. Come up to me afterwards, and I'll show you what I think they actually would look like. I have it on the paper. Aren't those just suspension? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're in fact each individual layer. Yeah. 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 The, the, the effective gravity field changes with radius, so it's not the same curve as on the suspension. But but it doesn't matter. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's not. You know. Anyway, but, 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 <laughs> but we can't draw that curve anyway. <laughs> so, next slide. Um, now I'm getting into things that my design program had even harder times with, which was squiggly lines and segments of arcs. Okay. Yeah. I've only got two more graphs. Um, it may be, there, there, there may be other things you can do with this. I have not run any kind of analysis with this, but I think you can do what I call zero arrow breaking, which is if you have a high elliptical orbit, and you can, but, but say your sp space station isn't equipped with an arrow breaking shield and you want to lower your orbit, you throw something else down in the atmosphere and let it do the arrow breaking for you, and you catch it and bounce it out. Um, so, so blue is your orbit. You throw something here with some excess velocity. This is changing your momentum. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. You, you, you hope it comes out with the comparable negative velocity relative to you. You hope you catch it on the other end. Um, <laughs> I didn't bother making a good view graph, but, but it, it, it's a cute phrase, and maybe it'll work if anybody wants to investigate it. You know, I'd love it. Um, I mean, here's, here's a close up of what it's doing. Yeah. In this thing, are you uh, using your uh, tethers just for uh, propulsion, or are you also uh, using some for any electrical? Um, just for propulsion. Yeah. Um, you probably could use it for electrical. I didn't mention it'd be nice to get power down to the catcher. And I asked a few people about transmitting power over, you know, <laughs> various things like Kevlar. It doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you might be able to do it with graphite. Another. Uh, <laughs> Another idea I've heard about changing your, your uh, orbit is, is by using the electric field that would work on Mars, but on, on using the magnetic field and, and uh, actually throwing out a current. Yeah. Um, um, as the tether crosses the magnetic field lines, it generates a, a potential. If you can get rid of the electrons at one end and collect electrons at the other, 
you can either um, gain energy, gain electrical energy, or, or if you put electrical energy into it, you can accelerate yourself. That's not inherently incompatible with this, but I, I didn't want to do it. Remember, I'm rotating too. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can change speed um, uh, next, next one. Um, similar to surrogate, barrel breaking is surrogate gravity assist. If somebody else gives gravity assist for you, um, you're, some, you're some station um, in this blue orbit. You're not near the moon. You throw a little craft around the moon, have it come back to you with excess velocity. You change your station's velocity by some tiny amount. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, maybe you can make up for some other momentum this way for free. Um, I don't know. I, so, and um, let's take questions and throw that last few breath over. And let's have the lights on. Or, actually, we're out of time.